Hey guys, my name is Alex, and today I want to talk to you about Heart Latitudes, a Michael Crichton book. This one's really interesting, um, and it, it brings up two very important things we're going to talk about throughout this video, which is one, how we even go about storytelling and the more raw angle of it, like things like Game of Thrones that are, that are kind of really intense, but we somehow still enjoy watching them. And then the other side of it, which is the nature of history how we talk about history as though it's black and white when it's really happening in full color. Um, so to start off, this is a book that was kind of caught my eye because Jurassic Park is my favorite book of all time. Um, and the movie's great, but the book is even better because it's like, Crichton actually like did his research, it seems to me. He talked with a statistician from, I think it was like University of uh, California, Berkeley. And the whole book, is under this premise of there, there's the, the theory, uh, there's chaos theory, right? And they talk about that in the movie, but it's this idea that like one small set of actions keeps rippling and rippling and rippling until it's completely unpredictable and things go off the rails. But he backs everything he says with some degree of like mathematics or he talks a little bit about like the, the uh, science behind bioengineering. So it puts you in this place where the book you're reading feels real. And you compare that to something like, I don't know, Harry Potter's an example that comes to mind. Like, I, I really like Harry Potter, but also when you start looking into the plot, you tend to see that, like, the plot seems really cool and it's, like, very visually stunning. But once you go outside of what's happening to the main characters, the rules of the universe start to break down. Like, why are certain things with this much money, um, like, the, their whole monetary system doesn't make sense. Um... But also, like, why don't wizards solve, like, simple issues with something that is simpler than magic? Or why don't they use technology? Why don't they do plenty of things? Like, and then why is there all this subjugation human rights issues in there? For another day. But those, those are two books that should kind of be the, the book ends of this uh, discussion. Because this book was something that I came to when I was having trouble reading fiction. I really like to read things that are, like, concrete. I like to learn about the world around me and have everything that I interact with kind of contribute in some way to my understanding of society and the world and what we can do about it. Um, because at the end of the day, I, I wanna be able to contribute something. I think that's, that's true for many of us. Um, but, and that, that's whether it's you know on our home level of just, can we work well with the people in our own household all the way up to, do you wanna change the world and everything in between, right? Or just advancing yourself. But you, you have some stake in society. And so question is, what do we do about it? And this book, I think, saddles a good middle ground where I knew that Crichton's work tended to be a little bit more like realistic science fiction, um, and in this case, realistic like, historical fiction. Uh, but th this, from what I've read, seems to be based on a true story. Um, and so you've got this captain who is in the Caribbean, he's in Jamaica, um, and the whole book is like this wild adventure that he has that he apparently did have but he's going to a spanish fort and then throughout the course of the book he is trying to evade spanish ships and then he comes back and there's like all this kerfuffle and like the the entire time he's just seeing crazy thing after crazy thing and you're like that can't be but at the same time we we know from like a number of like captain's logs and stuff that people tend to at least have a thought that they've seen something like a kraken, like a, a lady of the, the lady of the lake kind of events where they're like things they can't explain. Right. And it's, it, it kind of goes alongside with like UFO sightings, whether or not they exist. This book is interesting because it doesn't just tell you what's happening. It's telling you what people think is happening. And that's the true nature of history because we talk about events so much, right? Like, in, in every news article that you read and everything that you see on TV and stuff, it's all based on what's happening in the world around us. And history is happening even in those moments when we're watching something on TV and they're talking about like, oh, this TikTok trend or Fortnite dance or whatever. Those are things that are happening here and now. And by virtue of the fact that they are happening in a place and a time, they are a historical event. And history takes many different formats. It can be military events. It can be political decisions. It can be human rights things. It can be the changing of technology, it can be the types of arts and stuff that we show, the type of entertainment we watch. And so, you know, it, it can be anything. And that means that this 
is also a historical event, both in th this book, both in the way that it's talking about this time period, but also in the way that the people are seeing it. Because political, like the, the reason we have politics is because people have thoughts on these issues. It's not like the laws exist independently of people thinking about them. If that, that were the case, we'd have no reason to vote on anything. We have no reason to change the laws that exist um, or to create them in the first place. So this is cool because now as you go in, at first you're just kind of like, okay, we're meeting a bunch of characters and then slowly they're drawn together into this plot. And one of the things I really like about it is he's not just giving you like this action sequence. I've, I've read books I, and I, I've heard, I'll say, I think like parts of The Hobbit are like this too, where it's just like paragraphs of just like, he swings a sword, that guy swings a sword, someone gets stabbed. This is much more like, taking place over the course of a, of a location or over the course of time it's so like they get to an island they have to crawl through the jungle they have to climb up a hill or um up the side of a castle wall they have to infiltrate they have to fight they have to kill guards they have to sneak in they have to load bombs and it's like every single step is something and i think it also taps into that like idea i'm, I'm sure we've all heard the term of like sensationalism but like in the news, for example, and this is a, a pretty horrible instance, but if you think about something like a murder, right? The murder is not the act of killing, usually. It's all the things that lead up to it. You hear about the death of the person in the news, but a murder takes place because of either character traits that lead to it, right? Like if you've got some sort of imbalance, if you're not good at anger management, or if something triggers it, and then why were those events triggering? Like, why, why did it trigger violence? Or on the other hand, you have someone planning these things. And so it's awful either way, but the point is the story's bigger than the event that happens. Um, and that, that's true with political action too, right? If you want to make, like, like women's suffrage, right? Women's suffrage is not just an amendment that allows them to vote. It is everything in the women's rights movement for literally since longer than this country has been around because it's not just them working on, you know, do we get the right to vote? It's, do we get people to rally around this idea? What freedoms do we even want um, to go with it? And yeah, and so people thinking about the ideas of their time really has a place here. And it's also got this other context that you're witnessing history, we'll say, as it happened. Um, so for example, like child marriages or like rape and these these types of events that are you know kind of unthinkable today though they still happen they seem a lot more commonplace here and like here in in this book about pirates and so you know it, it can be very difficult to read because there are times when it's just completely gory like he doesn't really hold back there are times when it's sexually gory and like very not okay um Part of that leads us into empathy because while we're wa watching this happen as the reader, we're kind of asking the question like, oh, like what the heck? That's not okay. And then you kind of have to ask yourself, why is this not okay? What am I feeling? Why is this person in the book thinking what they're thinking? Like this, this one girl who gets raped kind of repeatedly, um, she's just sort of okay with it, it seems. And it makes you wonder, okay, what got her to this point? Because she is way too young to even have, should have having out, ever dealt with this. None of it is something that she asked for or wanted. And yet it keeps happening and she's sort of not minding it. So, you know, it, and it, it talks to like the era because a lot of marriages back then, a lot of relationships and stuff, they, they're not necessarily like they are today. There's always a handful, but it's more take than it is give and take uh, and that's something we'll talk about later but anyway so, so i mean in this video it, it will possibly sound a little bit like rambling i'm still trying to nail down the style of, of youtube video that i want to do but just trying to tap into the different aspects of this book um it as an adventure novel versus action it as historical fiction it as a historical work that's teaching us how to view history it as it's something of empathy where we can tap into the way these characters are thinking and it is something of a, a way to understand how politics changes 
which goes back to the whole thing of like, what are people thinking about the events that are happening? And what's cool is you also witness the power, the change of power kind of on like a ground level. You'll see like these islands of the Caribbean are kind of uneasy. Like the British are in some parts, the Spanish are in other parts, the French are in other parts. And not only do they all disagree with each other and they're trying to defend their territories, but also the people living on these islands, the, the actual natives, don't agree with their rule either. So you're kind of in this like thin ice situation everywhere in the Caribbean. And it's interesting because they, they talk about like, oh, you know, we'll just send some money to King, I think it was James, and he'll just be fine with whatever we do because we're like, we're doing it in a King's name. But it's like, hold, hold on. Like, that might be like patriotism at best, but it's not, it's not justified. And so it, it creates like a very dicey situation where now you're not just a person who is like partaking in these political events because like the, the main character is like very familiar with the governor who's trying to control Jamaica. Uh, but it also influences his actions. He knows that he needs to stay out of certain troubles and it, it creates for more realistic situations too because there's nuance in what happens. When he encounters the Spanish, but the Spanish are on an island that they shouldn't even have in the first place. And then he encounters like some natives of I think like the northern part of South America, like they're not able to communicate. He's running for his life. They have to stand guard to make sure they don't get eaten at night. Like there's, there's so many different little things that are happening and they're very unprepared for these situations, which also makes for interesting character development. It makes for like an interesting series of events because you have a lot of these cases where you either have like reactionary characters. It's just like, oh man, event after event is happening. Like, and, and that's sometimes when you wind up with like the deus ex machina is just like, the events happen in such a way that they work out for the character because the character is not doing anything other than being present and it can be interesting at first when the events are interesting but it gets to be a little bit dull after you find that the character is not a person with thoughts or feelings or intentions they're just a person who happens to be there and there's a person on the other end of it this captain hunter guy who is got very clear intentions of wanting to make money off of this crazy like one in a million voyage um and so he's very motivated but he keeps having these crazy events happen and that makes for a very interesting character um and and you'll find that characters throughout this like every one of them is kind of fit with this stereotype um some of which are, are very racist and i think that's also something to note from the era is how far we've gotten and also how far we still have to go because some of these, even even like the slang that they use here, is stuff that we still hear today. Um, it doesn't make it okay. So, anyways, um, I guess the, the other part I'll talk about is like history happening in black and white, but fiction being very colorful. Yet they're the same thing. You can't talk about a story that hasn't happened in some way, right? We can talk about like when Star Trek came out, I think it was like the 70s, right? They're talking about space travel. But we had been talking about going to space for several decades, and it had just happened. We had actually gone to space. So we were like, okay, we have some idea of what this looks like now. Astronomers have been looking at the sky for thousands of years. So it's not surprising that they write a story about space. And then when they write a story about people on the spaceship, their interactions are not new either. When you have like a medic character, we have medics on Earth. And your interactions with a medic when you are sick and there's some unknown disease should not be surprising when they're like, hey, this is what it probably is. Here's what you can do. And then if you also know them on a personal level, now there's drama related to that. And, and you watch this whole thing unfold at once. Um, and yet you kind of have this microcosm where all these people are interacting and kind of learning about each other, but they're placed in a new setting. And so that's what's new about this. And there's whole genres of shows that are literally just like supposed to be just like real life. Uh, but those are all talking about, just like I said at the beginning, about snapshots of history because they're all taking place in time and a place and a location. Like these, these events happen just as real as I'm happening right now, as you are watching this video or anything else you're doing in life. You're seeing it in, if you're not colorblind, in color, and you are physically interacting with the story and a really good story can sometimes just reach into you and pull at your heartstrings and that's that's the whole thing like i think 
Indiana Jones the Temple of Doom is not a great example of one that does that, but it's one that shows it on screen. Um, there's like a, a character who like literally reaches into someone's chest and pulls out his heart. And a really good story should be able to attack you with words that you agree with. Because if you have this like setting of like, oh, I understand the desire for money. I understand the desire for companionship. I understand the desire for friends and for adventure. Then you're like, oh, yeah, I, I get this guy. I get the characters in this book. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh man, I'm on this adventure too. I wonder what happens next. Didn't see that coming. Didn't didn't expect to see a Kraken today. Um, and so, you know, th that then all of a sudden you're involved. And so, uh, you know, I've heard many times like people go to fiction to run away from real life, to get something that is a break from reality. But this is the other side of reality. is when we're telling human stories, stories that have happened to people, but with some of the details changed, it's still interesting and that is part of our real life we have interesting things happen to us even if we're at an office job day after day you still have interesting interactions with people people have been places you've been places you were raised in a place you had parents who did things like all of the interactions within your life amount to something and it's more a matter of storytelling than it is a matter of what's actually happening and then there's the other side which is how these stories get passed down um, my mom has been studying oral histories in Italy, and what that essentially means is that a lot of these stories, especially of people who were not necessarily like well-educated, literate, or like in power, didn't get the opportunity to write their stories. Literacy was way lower back then than it is today. And so the best way to tell a story is to just tell it. You tell your kids, hey, this is what happened to me. My, my grandfather tells us a lot of like, Things that he did as a kid that you know he got in trouble for or how he like stopped going to school after first grade and then every time I hear the story it's like oh I, I stayed in first grade for four years then it was six years then it was three years and like the details don't matter but it's it's part of that sensationalism that we want to like, tell these these big ideas that, like this happened I was in first grade for forever but I'm still a proud person who knows what I know through my life experience uh, or you could say it was really boring because for six years in, in, in first grade, could you even imagine how monotonous that is? But it turns into a story and suddenly it's interesting, you know, and then you pass it down to your kids. Like my, my grandparents on, on my dad's side, they were kids when India was just getting its freedom. And it's like, you're undergoing this massive political change, but you don't necessarily see it right in front of your eyes. And I've asked them about it a little bit and, you know, I haven't gotten much of a response. It's just like, yeah, this was life. We've seen many changes. We've seen like huge changes in the political parties like Democrat and Republican. We've seen new smaller parties come to rise. We've seen new pushes for human rights. We've seen again, the war in Ukraine. We've seen things going on in China. We've seen information technology fundamentally change in the last 20 years. So these are all happening. They're big events, but we have to know how to tell, do storytelling in order to pass that on or even in order to find it interesting to ourselves. To not just be like, oh man, life is happening. It's like, oh, life is happening. And let me tell you about it. Because life is interesting. And if it's not, you're screwed. Like, life is boring without storytelling. Because we're just sitting there. We're having events happen to us. We're showing up to work every day, wishing we weren't there. But if there's that element of storytelling of, I talked to my coworker today, and I told him about this interesting that happened, thing that happened. I watched a YouTube video, I read a book, I even just sat and played video games. The video game is telling you a story about these main characters, or it's a story of you designing something in a game. There's always something happening, and there's always a good story to tell. And so figuring out what your story is, figuring out what stories are happening around you, leads to this very complex understanding of history. and. Understanding it for yourself gives you a sense of identity. It gives you a sense of who you align with, whether it be your nation, whether it be politics, whether it be the people in your community, or it, or rather, and it helps us understand just what it was like back then. Because if you're looking at the 1950s, you're like, how did they learn anything? How did they write research papers for hundreds of years without having access to the internet? I'm still wrapping my head around that, but it happened, right? And there's probably a good story that's the answer to that question. And so we have to put ourselves in that time period and be like, okay, so you had to go to the library for like hours and hours and hours and find books. You had to use your landline to hopefully get 
a hold of someone else who had like the only copy of the Gutenberg Bible and you just needed to read it. And you had to be so careful with it because there weren't necessarily the same kind of preservation chemicals back then as there are today. And so there's just like all these little details that add up and it's like, yeah, the reality of that situation might be like my friends who's sitting in her job most days just counting seeds. The reality of that situation might be you are just sitting there very carefully turning one page at a time to make sure that this 500 year old book doesn't crumble. And then you're going through with a magnifying glass. You have to notate every single thing you see. And it could take forever. But it was super interesting because you got to see a thing that very few people in the entire world get to see. And that marks a landmark in the development of modern Christianity or religion or whatever. Right. But there's there's more to the story and it's about storytelling. And so this book, in many ways, is not just about what story it's telling. It's about what it tells us about storytelling. And understanding that for ourselves, understanding that for entertainment, understanding that for the people around us, helps us be more well-rounded and helps us understand where we go next. If you want to solve a conflict, put yourself in someone else's head and figure out why they're saying what they're saying. Why are you saying what you're saying? and then meet in the middle, right? And so there's so much more to talk about, and I'll keep going through other books. I don't know if you can see, there's a stack, there's the one I'm reading right now, but there's, there's plenty more to discuss about the way we see the world, and then what questions we ask, and what answers we perceive, and what answers we get, what answers we search for. And so that's where I'll leave you today. Um, put some good books down in the comment section, and tell me what you think of them. Tell me what they made you realize. And you'll find that you start some interesting discussions with other people who think the exact opposite or who think differently or who think the same, but ultimately are moving all of us forward to understanding the world around us a bit better. I'll see you guys later.